Sutta number 63, the shorter discourse to Malukya Putta, the Chula Malukya Sutta, in the middle link sayings. Chula Malukya. Thus have I heard on one occasion a blessed one was living in Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Kandika's Park. Then, while the venerable Malukaputta was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. These speculative views have been left undeclared by the Blessed One, set aside and rejected by him, namely, the world is eternal, and the world is not eternal. The world is finite and the world is infinite. The soul is the same as the body. The soul is one thing and the body another. And after death, the Tathagata exists. After death, the Tathagata does not exist. And after death, the Tathagata both exists and does not exist. And after death, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. The Blessed One does not declare these to me, and I do not approve of and accept the fact that he does not declare these to me. <coughs> so I shall go to the Blessed One and ask him the meaning of this. If he declares to me either the world is eternal or the world is not eternal, or after the death of the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, then I will lead the holy life under him. If he does not declare these to me, I will abandon the training and return to the world. This is kind of an interesting sutta, and he gets it, this monk gets it set in his mind that these views are really important to understand whether the world is eternal, whether it's not eternal, whether the soul is, is part of the body or not, and all of these kind of things. But these are all just conceptual thinking, and they lead to a lot of philosophical discussion, but there's never any answer to give. Because you take one position, I'm going to take the other position, and then there's going to, we're going to discuss that all night, but there's no solution. So when the Buddha was asked these kind of things, he never answered. <coughs> and this monk is making it up in his mind, well, if the Buddha isn't going to answer these kind of things, then... I don't want to be a monk anymore because I want to know these things. So he's uh, trying to set it up in his mind that if he's not going to get the answers, then he'll just become a layman again. So. Then when it was evening, the venerable Ma Malukya Putta arose from meditation and went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told him, Here, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in my mind. These speculative views have been left undeclared by the Blessed One. If he does not declare these to me, I will abandon the training and return to the low life. If the Blessed One knows whether the world is eternal, let the Blessed One declare to me the world is eternal. If the Blessed One knows the world is not eternal, let the Blessed One declare to me the world is not eternal. If the Blessed One does not know whether the world is eternal or the world is not eternal, then it is straightforward for one who does not know and does not say
to say, I do not know, I do not see. If the Blessed One knows the world is finite, or the world is infinite, or the soul is the same as the body, or the soul is one thing and the body another, or after death the Tathagata exists, or after death the Tathagata does not exist. If the Blessed One knows that after death the Tathagata both exists and does not exist, let the Blessed One declare to me, if the Blessed One knows after death the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, let the Blessed One declare that to me. If the Blessed One does not know either that after death the Tathagata both exist and does not exist, or after death the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, then it is straightforward for him, or it is straightforward <coughs> for one who does not know and does not see to say, I do not know, I do not see. Now, this is when he gets slapped, this monk gets slapped a little bit for uh, demanding to have these kind of speculative answers. How then did I ever say to you, come, lead the holy life under me, and I will declare to you the world is eternal, or after death a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist? No, venerable sir. Did you ever tell me I will lead the holy life under the Blessed One, and the Blessed One will declare to me <coughs> the world is eternal, or after death a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. No, venerable sir, that being so misguided man, who are you and what are you abandoning? Slap. If anyone should say thus, I will not lead the holy life under the Blessed One until the Blessed One declares to me the world is eternal and all the rest of the questions. That would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata, and meanwhile that person would die. Suppose a man were wounded by an arrow thickly smeared with poison, and his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives, brought a surgeon to treat him. The man would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out this arrow until I know whether the man who, was, who wounded me was a noble or a brahmin or a merchant or a worker. And he would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out this arrow until I know the name of and clan of the man who wounded me, until I know whether the man who wounded me was tall or short or middle height, until I know whether the man who wounded me was dark brown or golden skinned, until I know whether the man who wounded me lives in such a village or town or city, until I know whether the bow that wounded me was a longbow or crossbow. Until I know whether the bowstring that, that wounded me was fiber or reed or sinew or hemp or bark. Until I know whether the shaft that wounded me was wild or cultivated. Until I know with what kind of feathers the shaft was that, that wounded me was fitted, whether those of a vulture or a heron or a hawk or a peacock or a stork, until I know with what kind of sinew the shaft was that wounded me was bound, whether that of an ox or a buffalo or a deer or a monkey, until I know what kind of arrow it was that wounded me, whether it was hoof-tipped or curved or barbed or calf-toothed or oleander. All this 
would still not be known to that man, meanwhile he would die. So too, if anyone should say thus, I will not lead the holy life under the Blessed One until the Blessed One declares to me, the world is eternal. The world is not eternal. Or after a death of a Tathagatha, a Tathagatha neither exists or does not exist. That would still remain undeclared by the Tathagatha. Meanwhile, that person would die. Malukya Puta, if there is the view the world is eternal, the holy life cannot be lived. If there was the view the world is not eternal, the holy life cannot be lived. Whether there is the view the world is eternal or the view the world is not eternal, there is birth, there is aging, there is death, there are sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and, and despair. despair. The, uh, the destruction of which I prescribe here and now. If there is the view, the world is finite, the world is infinite. The soul is the same as the body. The soul is one thing and the body another. After the death of the Tathagatha, a Tathagatha exists. After death, a Tathagatha does not exist. The holy life cannot be lived. If there is the view after death, the Tathagatha both exists and does not exist, the holy life cannot be lived. If there is the view after death, the Tathagatha neither exists nor does not exist, the holy life cannot be lived. Whether there is the view after the death of a Tathagatha both exists and does not exist, or the view after death of a Tathagatha neither exists nor does not exist, there is birth, there is aging, there is death, there are sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, the destruction of which I prescribe here and now. So what he's basically saying is get out of your concepts about these things. They don't lead to the cessation of suffering. There's still birth, there's still all of the links of dependent origination that arise when the conditions are right for them to arise. It goes from birth all the way through death, ignorance, formations, consciousness, mentality, materiality, sixfold base, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, being. Don't like the translation even yet. Experience, uh, habitual tendency, birth, death, and aging again. These processes are continually arising and passing away. Knowing whether the, the soul is one thing and the body is something else doesn't lead to seeing this. It leads to a lot of mental gymnastics so that you can get into uh, good arguments and discussions but it doesn't lead to the cessation of suffering. That's what the whole of the Buddha's teaching is about. He never guaranteed anybody that he would answer philosophical questions. He did, however, say, if you follow this path and you see this and you see this and you see this, it will lead to the cessation of suffering. Every time you are sitting down to meditate, 
you sit with your back nicely straight, you sit in a comfortable posture, whether it's on a chair or on the floor, it doesn't really matter. <coughs> you stay with your object of meditation. If you're practicing loving kindness, you stay with that glowing, warm feeling of loving kindness. You make a wish for happiness and feel that wish, whatever your wish happens to be. If you make a wish for somebody to be peaceful and calm, then feel that peace and calm. Put that peace and calm feeling into your heart into that radiating, warm, glowy feeling. And stay with that feeling as long as you can. If there is a distraction, let go of the distraction. A distraction is anything that pulls your mind away from your object of meditation. Let go of the distraction. If it's a thought, let the thought be there, but don't keep your attention on the thought. Notice that there is a tension or tightness, and let that tension or tightness go. There's tension and tightness in both body and mind, especially tension and tightness in the head. Let it be relaxed. Feel your mind expand and take a little step down. And then take that mind that is very pure, that is very clear, that doesn't have any distraction in it, back to your object of meditation. It doesn't matter how many times your mind gets distracted. You still treat every distraction in the same way. Every time you let go of that distraction and relax and gently come back to your object of meditation, you are developing your mindfulness so that it becomes sharper, more alert. So any kind of distraction, even though you would call it a hindrance, is a very important aspect of the meditation that helps you. Too many times people will uh, talk about just sitting in silence, or sitting in peace, or sitting in calm. And that's nice but you don't really learn how your mind is working. The Buddha was real big on talking about the Four Noble Truths. Every one of the, the links of dependent origination is a form of suffering. Every one of them, every one of those links is a form of suffering. What's the cause of suffering? What's the second noble truth? What's the origin of that suffering? How do you get to the cessation of that suffering? There is the cessation. You let it be and relax and come back. What is the way leading to the cessation of the suffering? or the cessation of the craving, because that's what it really boils down to. The Four Noble Truths are about the cause of craving, the cessation of craving, and the way leading to the cessation of craving. When your mind becomes more clear, you begin to see hindrances when they first start to arise. And this is important. 
If you don't see a hindrance when it first arises, you will get caught by that hindrance and then you will have all kinds of emotional and physical problems arise because of it. Now, it doesn't matter whether that distraction is a uh, sensation that arises in your body and, or a mental feeling that arises in the body, in, in your mind. Either way you treat feeling in the same way. When a feeling arises, the truth is it's there. Whether you like it to be there or not, doesn't really matter. What you need to do is allow the feeling to be there. Let go of that tight mental fist that's gripped around it, that doesn't want that feeling to be there, that wants the feeling to be different. Allow the feeling to be there and relax. When a physical feeling arises, there is 98% of the time there are thoughts about the feeling that arise. I wish it wasn't there. Why does it have to bother me now? Every thought about the feeling causes the feeling to be bigger and more intense. So first, you let go of the thoughts and relax. Next, you see the tight mental fist wrapped around the feeling, you allow the feeling to be there without any resistance at all, and relax. Bring that relaxed mind back to your object of meditation. It doesn't matter whether it's a physical feeling or an emotional feeling. You treat all feeling in the same way. If it's a sensation that arises, you get a pain in your knee or a pain in your back, you treat it in the same way as you treat sadness, depression, unhappiness of whatever form it seems to take. You keep letting go and letting that feeling be relaxing and coming back. The essence of the Buddha's teaching is not about why things arise. That's for psychotherapists, that's for psychologists. They can look at that if they want. The meditation is about how mind's attention moves from one thing to another, to another, to another. You want to be able to see very clearly how mind moves. And the more clearly you see how mind moves, the easier it is to recognize it and let it go so the movement doesn't last as long. When that starts to happen, your mind starts to stay on your object of meditation by itself without any effort for longer and longer periods of time. One of the things that I rather insist on when people are practicing loving kindness, especially, but also mindfulness of breathing, is that you smile. And smile all the time. Smile with your mind Smile with your eyes, even though your eyes are closed. Smile with your lips, a little Buddha smile, and smile with your heart. I had somebody yesterday tell me that they weren't about to walk around with a smile plastered on their face. And I said, why? And he said, well, it's not a real smile. And honestly, it doesn't matter whether it's a real smile or not at first. As you smile more and more, your mental state starts to go up. And when your mental state goes up, joy has a tendency to arise. 
and joy arises. Your mind is very alert, your mind is very clear, your mind is very agile. And it's easy to recognize when your mind starts to get pulled down. And you can let that go. <coughs> this helps you to have equanimity all of the time. Okay, so I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Therefore, remember what I have left undeclared as undeclared, and remember what I have left declared as declared, and what I have left undeclared, the world is eternal. I have left undeclared, the world <coughs> is not eternal. I have left undeclared, the world is finite, I have left undeclared. The world is infinite, I have left undeclared. The soul is the same as the body, I have left undeclared. The soul is one thing and the body another, I have left undeclared. After death a Tathagatha exists, I have left undeclared. After death a Tathagatha does not exist, I have left undeclared. After death the Tathagatha both exist and does not exist, I have left undeclared. After the death of a Tathagatha, after death a Tathagatha neither exists nor does not exist, I have left undeclared. Why have I left that undeclared? because it is unbeneficial. It does not belong to the fundamentals of the holy life. It does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. That is why I have left it undeclared. And what have I declared? This is suffering. I have declared. This is the origin of suffering, I have declared. This is the cessation of suffering, I have declared. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering, I have declared. Why have I declared that? Because it is beneficial, it belongs to the fundamentals of the holy life. It leads to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. That is why I have declared it. Therefore, remember what I have left undeclared as undeclared, and remember what I have left declared as declared. That is what the, blue, the blue, Blessed One said. The Venerable Monk was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's word. So, let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and then may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas and mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sada. Stay here for just a minute.